Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that we've spent the last few programs looking at all the mitigation and adaptation recommendations contained in the last couple of chapters of the IPCC report released back on October the 8th. Week by week, we're compiling a summary list of all the actions that the world needs to see discussed and agreed at the crucial International Climate Conference at COP24 in Katowice in Poland this December. So far, we've covered all these areas, which brings us all the way to the last section of chapter four of the report. And that section deals with what the IPCC calls overarching adaptation options. The majority of the measures that the report considers in chapter four are all about reducing carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. But it's worth just mentioning at this stage that this section of the report does also refer to other pollutants that they call short-lived climate forces. Here's the table they published in the report showing methane, hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs and black carbon. We'll focus on these properly in a later programme, but I know there'll be a lot of people watching this screaming at the screen that there's a massive emission in the IPCC's list of methane sources. And that emission has to do with the Arctic. Here's some commentary on that region of the planet from earlier in the IPCC report itself. The Arctic is undergoing the most rapid climate change globally, warming by 1.9 degrees Celsius over the last 30 years. For two degrees warming relative to pre-industrial levels, chances of an ice-free Arctic during the summer are substantially higher than at 1.5 degrees Celsius, with permafrost melt, increased instances of storm surge and extreme weather events anticipated along with later ice freeze up, earlier break up and a longer ice-free open water season. What they don't mention in that passage, and some would say this is almost willfully negligent on their part, is that the rate of permafrost melt is accelerating rapidly and that melting is releasing huge quantities of methane. NASA's climate change webpage tells us the impact on the climate may mean an influx of permafrost derived methane into the atmosphere in the mid 21st century which is not currently accounted for in climate projections which means that an extra burst of methane will add significantly to the warming of the planet in a way that's not reflected at all in any of the RCP graphs. I'll be taking a really detailed look at that phenomenon in a later program but this week we're looking at all the potential technologies that the IPCC are reliant on to provide the global cooling that allows their RCP models to stay within the upward aspiration of two degrees Celsius of warming. The IPCC places a great deal of reliance on carbon dioxide removal as the main strategy that's baked into all their RCP models to achieve the slowdown and even the reversal of what they call the 1.5 degrees Celsius overshoot which they expect to happen in the middle part of this century, even with the best case scenario. In fact, they go so far as to include this quote, in the IPCC fifth assessment report, the vast majority of scenarios assessed with a 66% or better chance of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius by 2100 include carbon dioxide removal. The IPCC scientists put particular emphasis on the technology of bioenergy and carbon capture or BECS which is something we had a look at a couple of weeks ago and you can click up there to have a look at that program. But a lot of scientific commentators are deeply skeptical about the efficacy of BEX and the amount of land that would be required to make it have any real impact. So I'm gonna park that one for this week and have a good detailed look at that in a full program of its own later on in the series. Thankfully though, there are several strategies other than BEX that the IPCC have assessed. The first of which is afforestation and reforestation. Aforestation is the planting of trees on land that hasn't been a forest for at least 50 years, whereas reforestation is the re-establishment of existing forests that humans have hacked or burnt down to less than 10% of their previous size. Research suggests there's about 500 mega hectares of land that could be available for the re-establishment of forests, and that's an area about two thirds the size of Australia. That amount of replanted trees could recapture or sequester, to use the scientific lingo, at least 3.7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year for decades to come. This level of afforestation would actually represent a higher land and water footprint than BEX, but unlike BEX, new trees would have a positive impact on nutrients and the energy requirements once you've got them planted would be negligible. 
And if we can get reforestation right in all the relevant countries around the world, then according to these people, we'd be recapturing 17.9 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per year by 2030. One big caveat from the IPCC here though, capturing CO2 in this way is not as permanent a solution as reducing emissions from fossil fuels in the first place. Let me give you one risk scenario. Forest fires. You plant five mega hectares of brand new trees and some malevolent regime decides to burn them down as part of some sort of future territorial struggle, then all that locked up CO2 literally goes up in smoke, straight into the atmosphere. As well as that, forests can get saturated with CO2, which is a process that happens on a decadal or century timeline, as opposed to the multiple thousands of years that CO2 is stored geologically under the ground. And reforestation really needs to take priority over afforestation. If we overplant new trees on grassland ecosystems or diversified agricultural landscapes, then we may get negative impacts on biodiversity and water resources. On the other hand, restoring an existing forest ecosystem with native species has been shown to have positive social and environmental impacts. The report does point out though that if we do actually ever manage to reduce our global consumption of meat, and particularly red meat, then vast tracts of what's currently single crop land will be freed up to plant these new trees on. So this is going to take really careful management and extremely close geopolitical cooperation. Next, the report assesses something called soil carbon sequestration, or SCS for short. Not one that I imagine many of us would have instinctively thought about, but apparently there's strong evidence that putting CO2 back into the earth by restoring degraded land and employing conservation agriculture management has significant co-benefits in agricultural ecosystems. And this technology is pretty much cost-effective without any climate policy, so this is a real possibility. At a global level, it's reckoned we could lock up about 5 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. The good thing about SCS is that it's got negligible water and energy requirements. It actually helps with nutrients and food security, and it can be implemented without changing current land use. You do get the same saturation issue that we touched on with forests, but that can take up to 100 years. So right now, this technique looks pretty favourable. A relatively new initiative that seems to be gaining real traction, not only in the scientific community, but also in the commercial world, is something called Direct Air Carbon Capture and Storage, or DAX. In the words of the IPCC report, capturing CO2 from ambient air through chemical processes with subsequent storage of the CO2 in geological formations is independent of source and timing of emissions and can avoid competition for land. In other words, carbon dioxide is in the air all around us. So all we've got to do is suck it out with some kind of souped up vacuum cleaner, right? Not quite. The CO2 concentration in ambient air is 100 to 300 times lower than at gas or coal fired power plants. So you need a whole lot more energy to capture it than you would at a factory exhaust flue. Research suggests that the energy consumption could be up to 12.9 gigajoules per tonne of CO2 captured, so you're going to need an entire power station size supply to make this work at scale. And of course that power will need to come from renewable sources like wind and solar, otherwise you'll be emitting more CO2 than you're capturing. Nevertheless, commercial scale equipment is being installed in various locations. These guys at Climeworks installed their first full-scale plant in 2017. Two of these modules housing 12 fans are about the size of a shipping container and this full-scale setup is now capturing around 900 tonnes of CO2 per year. Not bad, but not significant compared to the 40,000 million tonnes that the human species is currently splurging out every year. But in fact, the business plan of Climeworks is to build enough plants to capture the equivalent of 1% of CO2 emissions by 2025. And to do that, they'll need to build 750,000 shipping containers worth of fans around the world. But that's the same number of shipping containers that comes out of Shanghai's harbour in two weeks. So while it's a mind-boggling number, it is perfectly feasible. The last two negative emissions technologies considered by the IPCC report are arguably the two most contentious. Ocean fertilisation, otherwise known as iron seeding, is the first of these ideas. Phytoplankton take in massive amounts of CO2 as part of their photosynthesis. In fact, the oceans are one of the biggest CO2 reservoirs we've got on the planet. 
Iron turns out to be one of the key stimulants to the growth of these algae. The theory is that by dumping huge volumes of powdered iron particles into the ocean, we'd encourage algal blooms that would draw loads of CO2 out of the atmosphere and sink it safely to the bottom of the sea when the phytoplankton die. But there's a concern that these algal blooms may cause a serious decrease in available oxygen in the water, with negative impacts on the biodiversity of the oceans. Small-scale trials have been carried out in the last decade or so, but with very mixed results. In some areas, the iron made no discernible difference at all. In other instances, the extra CO2 made the water more acidic, and in a couple of cases, the algae simply got eaten by the surrounding sea life, putting the CO2 back into the food chain. And of course, we'd have to continue doing it for as long as we were creating CO2 elsewhere. So it's really more of a sticking plaster than a cure. And apparently, the London Protocol of the International Maritime Organization has asserted authority for regulation of ocean fertilization, which is widely viewed as a de facto moratorium on commercial ocean fertilization activities. So I wouldn't hold your breath on this one. The second kind of out there idea is something called solar radiation modification, or SRM, and specifically a technique known as stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI. On the 18th of May 1980, Mount St. Helens in the northwest of the United States erupted with an energy equivalent to 1500 Hiroshima atom bombs, sending superheated gas 15 miles up into the atmosphere at speeds of up to 400 miles an hour. On the 15th of June 1991, Mount Pinatubo exploded in a cataclysmic eruption that ejected more than 5 cubic kilometres of material 22 miles high. Satellites tracked the ash cloud several times around the globe. Both these eruptions spewed millions of tonnes of sulphur dioxide high up into the atmosphere, which reacted with water vapour to make sulphuric acid, which in turn condensed in the stratosphere to make things called sulphate aerosols which just happened to act like billions of tiny mirrors reflecting sunlight back into space. The result was that in both cases, the skies dimmed a little and the average global temperature went down by a few tenths of a degree Celsius for a couple of years. Solar radiation modification aims to mimic the effects of volcanoes, but of course without the eruptions. What if we took a fleet of, say, a few hundred jumbo jets and flew them around the world once or twice a year, releasing sulphur dioxide into the atmosphere? That way, we could keep spewing carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, and as long as we were also spewing sulphur dioxide into the atmosphere in sufficient quantity, then the two actions would cancel each other out. If you're a conspiracy theorist, you might be shouting chemtrails at the screen right now. Because some believe, incorrectly, that NASA and others have been secretly spewing chemicals like sulphur dioxide out the back of planes for decades, apparently for all sorts of nefarious reasons, including solar radiation management. In fact, the real risk of mass sulphur dioxide dispersion is that it may well result in catastrophic air pollution and will almost certainly cause acid rain. As well as this, it's got the inconvenient side effect of destroying the ozone layer which is the planet's main protection against deadly ultraviolet radiation from the sun, and which has only just started recovering from the last time we battered it with CFCs. So the scientific literature only really supports solar radiation modification as a kind of last ditch option if we really do find ourselves totally screwed in the middle of this century and we've absolutely run out of any other ideas. So it's a kind of lesser of two evils really. According to the report, Several possible institutional arrangements have been considered for SRM governance. Under the Subsidiary Body on Scientific and Technological Advice, which is SBSTA, or the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, UNCBD, or through a consortium of states. So once again, really careful geopolitical cooperation have been needed on this one. In fact, the UNCBD gives guidance that no climate-related geoengineering activities that may affect biodiversity should take place. So a simple addition to Antonio's to-do list this week, something like a comprehensive international agreement on the type and extent of global carbon dioxide removal methods to be written into the legal framework of each nation. We're only a couple of weeks away now from the main event of COP24 in Katowice in Poland in December. In the run-up to that, I'm going to be talking to Professor Peter Wadhams to get his reaction to the IPCC report 
and to ask him what he sees as the absolutely essential priorities that need to come out of the COP24 conference, which he himself will be attending. That's it for now though. Regular viewers will know that this channel is dedicated to following four main principles with regard to climate change. Number one is to provide insight. Number two is to relate to collective action. Number three is to drive behavioral change. And number four is to be accessible to and achievable by most people. If you feel like that's a useful contribution to the debate, then please do subscribe to the channel so that we can raise the profile with the YouTube search algorithms and get the message out to as many people as possible. It's absolutely free to do that. All you need to do is to go to my welcome page on YouTube and click the subscribe button and you can get there by clicking here. I do hope you're finding this little mini series helpful. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.